So um, it's my pleasure to introduce the Dodge Lecture uh, today. This is something that occurs every year in honor of Dr. Dodge and is put on by in memory of him by the foundation uh, through St. Luke's. Uh, we appreciate their support. Um, it is a big deal, uh, we think, in both an honor to the person that's chosen uh, as well as a lot of work <laughs> because they actually visit all three institutions, uh, KU here and St. Luke's. Uh, he was at KU yesterday. He'll be at St. Luke's in the morning. And obviously, you people from all three places are able to um, zoom in this year. Last year, it was only by Zoom, so it was uh, a little disappointing. Um, this is, I think, um, year 40 um, of this, and if you you look at your, I think I'm on, if you look at your, um, if you have those, the little booklets, uh, in the middle, there'll be a list of everybody who's been a Dodge lecturer, and it looks like a who's who of endocrinology. Um, so um, sometimes you, you, we talk to somebody and they say, well, why, why would I want to do this? And one of the things we do is we say, well, here's the people who have done it in the past. And they go, oh, my God, this is really an honor. Uh, and it's an honor of Dr. Dodge, who was an incredible teacher and investigator, uh, and sort of an endocrinologist before endocrinology um, uh, existed or um, was, was its own subspecialty. So uh, Dr. Nzuki has uh, done most of his training at Yale. Um, he has been involved with numerous trials. Um, he is interested in diabetes but uh, is also particularly interested in the uh, interaction between diabetes and cardiovascular issues, uh, which is a hot topic. Um, their clinics are popping up with cardiometabolic clinics. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons we chose him to actually be the Dodge Lecturer this year was because of the timeliness of the topic and the research that he's done and his um, uh, prominence in the field. Um, again, most of his training's been through Yale, um, and he's stayed there uh, for a couple years. Uh, and we are so delighted to have him uh, speak today on the Holy Grail. Thank you very much, Lamont. Uh, no one else will have me. That's why I stayed at uh, Yale University. Um, so um, as Lamont said, this has been an interest area of mine because I've always wondered why um, we never truly were able to prove that glucose control in diabetes would reduce cardiovascular disease, which is a crazy thought, right? Uh, it's the most common uh, complication of diabetes. It's the reason our patients with diabetes die from coronary disease, stroke, and heart failure. But as I'll take you through this story, we were never able until recently uh, to demonstrate that anything we did as endocrinologists actually uh, bent that curve. The cardiologists certainly were very good at uh, their stents and bypass surgeries, uh, statin drugs, which were originally endocrinologist drugs, by the way, uh, and then blood pressure therapies. But for glucose reduction, which was kind of our line of work, um, it's been very frustrating uh, that trial after trial was never able to demonstrate uh, that uh, we certainly did a good job preventing blindness and renal failure and uh, loss of limb in terms of neuropathy. But the major complication, as mentioned, cardiovascular disease, not so much. So these are my disclosures. And uh, the way I've structured my comments is to first give you um, a little bit of uh, information about what has been known about this notion of glucose lowering and cardiovascular risk reduction. There's some surprises here. And then just to make sure we're on the same playing field, I'll review very quickly the current 
2021 landscape of type 2 diabetes therapies. It's an increasingly complex pharmacopoeia, but I hope to give you some insights in terms of how to categorize them uh, in, your, in your head. And then we'll uh, go through three drug classes, two of which have now been kind of uh, edified in the guidelines for cardiovascular risk reduction in those patients at cardiovascular risk, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists. If you've heard about these medications, um, I'll hope to give you a little bit more insights in terms of what their impact is on cardiovascular as well as renal risk. And then we'll take a little bit of a trip back to the future with the thiazolidine diones. I had a dinner with endocrinologists last night. We spent the whole hour talking about this drug class. Some of the older physicians in the audience may remember the heyday of the TZDs, the so-called glitazones, uh, back in the early 2000s. They actually constituted about a quarter of all diabetes drug sales in the U.S., and now they're kind of a minuscule uh, proportion of drug sales. But there is some newer information suggesting that maybe we've forgotten about this drug <coughs> class a little bit too quickly, and they should be uh, maybe inculcated into the guidelines a little bit more than they have been, and then we will look at those guidelines. So... We could spend 20 minutes on this slide, but to summarize the uh, status of diabetes clinical trials uh, dating back uh, 30 years uh, from the DCCT, which involved type 1 diabetes trials, to the UKPDS, which involved type 2 diabetes patients, I should say, and then Accord, Advance, and VADT, which were, again, focused on type 2 diabetes uh, these studies were uh, set up similarly in terms of having two groups, one assigned to more intensive control of their glycemia, uh, using a variety of tools. In other words, these were not studies looking at a specific benefit of a specific drug category, but they had algorithms in place, and the focus was, let's get your hemoglobin A1C tighter than was considered the standard of care. And then, obviously, the control group were left to the devices of whatever was going on at that time in terms of the medical standard of care for diabetes. And the notion was, hey, here's a disease that is marked by hyperglycemia, right? That's what distinguishes diabetes from non-diabetes. So it makes total sense that if you reduce plasma glucose concentrations and ultimately hemoglobin A1C down toward normal, that you should obliterate the complications of diabetes. That seems like a simple statement, um, but at one time, uh, there were supporters and deniers of the glucose hypothesis. Some felt that the complications of diabetes actually had nothing to do with the blood glucose, that the blood glucose was an innocent bystander. Um, but um, as we will see, clearly the microvascular complications of diabetes, so neuropathy, retinopathy, and nephropathy, in all of these trials, from type 1 diabetes uh, to the type 2 diabetes trials, uh, Without question, the microvascular complications of diabetes are reduced by glucose control. So the glucose hypothesis was proven in 1993 with the publication of the DCCT and then buttressed in 1998 with the publication of the UKPDS. So spanning from type 1 to type 2 diabetes, I don't think anybody questions the value of good glucose control. You can say that, you know, in older patients who are in their late 70s, early 80s, uh, that the price of diabetes control in terms of increasing risk of hypoglycemia may not be worth the benefit at that age. I mean, so what? You prevent a little albuminuria. Who cares? Who dips their urine every day, you know? But certainly in, in younger patients uh, with s uh, significant life expectancy, uh, you can definitely impact beneficially patients' lives in terms of not needing to go to the dialysis machine three times a week, uh, keeping all 10 toes, and, and seeing well. So without question. On the right-hand side of the slide and in the middle, you see uh, the bad news about diabetes clinical trials, which is that uh, investigators have tried for years now, again, dating back to the 1980s when the DCCT was started. So, gosh, more than 40 years, actually, that... Uh, invariably, the quality of glucose control did not have any significant impact on the development of the CV complications, so macrovascular uh, disease. So neutrality was achieved, meaning that 
irrespective of which arm of the trial you were randomized to, tight control or, or standard looser control, the CV events were about the same. There were maybe some trends, but nothing statistically significant. Nothing, no home run here in terms of, yes, glucose control prevents myocardial infarction or stroke or CV death. In fact, the ACCORD study, which was actually terminated early, I believe in 2008, um, because they, the, the Data Monitoring Safety Board, DF, Data Safety Monitoring Board, DSMB, that is an independent body that looks at the data in an unblinded fashion in most circumstances, actually detected a puzzling increase in mortality in those patients that were randomized to the more intensive arm of the trial. That's right, an increase in mortality. So they actually said, whoa, what's going on here? Let's terminate the study and figure out what is driving this risk increase, which was surprising. So I, I must tell you that this led to a lot of um, depression in our field because not only couldn't we prove that we were doing good by our patients, but here's now the suggestion that we're actually doing harm by our patients. And that led to lots of additional studies trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, fast forward now 10 years plus beyond that, we still don't know. We still don't know why in this specific study uh, there was increase in mortality. Sometimes it's a fluke, just bad luck of the trial. Uh, obviously, the main question that people had was, could this relate to hypoglycemia? Because there was a lots of insulin therapy used in this trial, and clearly three times more hypoglycemia, including severe events. And these were older patients with CV disease or at risk for CV disease, so it's not a stretch of the imagination to say that, hey, you were leading to a lot of hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia leads to you know, loss of consciousness, cardiac arrhythmias, but it's, it's not quite that clear. In fact, the people in the ACCORD study that ended up dying were the people who were in the intensive control arm of the trial who did not get their hemoglobin A1C down. So maybe there's either resistance or resistance to therapy or non-adherence to therapy, who knows? But it, it led to a lot of introspection in our field as to the proper glucose target uh, to achieve in patients with type 2 diabetes. So lots of bad news in 20, 30, 40 years of diabetes clinical trials. So let's talk about how we treat diabetes. And um, I'm not going to review this extensively, but I just wanted to give you the background of the current sense of the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. If this were a slide or a lecture on type 1 diabetes, this would be a 15-second slide. And it would say, that there's loss of pancreatic beta cell secretion from autoimmune destruction. We don't really understand how that evolves in terms of what causes the immune system to um, go awry, but there is beta cell destruction, and when you have beta cell destruction, you have loss of insulin. When you have loss of insulin, you have hyperglycemia. Case closed at a tissue level, we understand type 1 diabetes. Not at a molecular level, but at a tissue level. Type 2 diabetes, I could spend 20 minutes on this slide because the pathogenesis is enormously complex. And the reason I show it is, uh, particularly for the trainees and the students, is to understand exactly how the pharmacopoeia of type 2 diabetes has developed and why there are so many drug categories in type 2 diabetes that have nothing to do with each other. And this is because there's so many pathophysiological abnormalities in this disease. So if you're the CEO of a Merck or a Pfizer, you're going to set your scientists focused on one of these organs and say, hey, how can I lower blood glucose concentrations? And they'll say, well, we'll try to figure out the pathogenesis in that organ and we'll try to develop pharmacotherapies that address that uh, defect in that, um, at a tissue level. So we have insulin resistance, uh, which is uh, demonstrated here on the lower right of the slide. Uh, this is uh, the sink for glucose after we eat, specifically is the muscle and to some degree the fat. They take up glucose from the circulation. Uh, that is under the direction of the magical hormone insulin from the uh, pancreatic beta cell. So when insulin is, when the patient is insulin resistant, it needs more insulin to get glucose inside. So the pancreas is able to meet that demand in most circumstances. So in our uh, patients, our uh, friends, families, maybe ourselves that may be a little bit overweight, uh, the obesity 
drives insulin resistance through complicated mechanisms. Uh, but the pancreatic response is hyperinsulinemia. So the pancreas always wants to keep glucose levels in the normal range, so it will do what it can to cram glucose into these peripheral tissues because it has a set point. It wants to keep blood glucose concentrations in the normal range. So if that were the only abnormality in type 2 diabetes or in, or in uh, metabolic syndrome insulin resistance, we would never have type 2 diabetes because the pan pancreas would simply be hyperinsulinemic and try to get glucose levels down. That obviously is not the case. There's 34 million people with diabetes in the U.S., so clearly some of them have had pancreatic failure or deficiency of insulin production, never to the point of type 1 diabetes. So they're able to make some insulin, but relatively not enough to keep the muscle satisfied. So that abnormality of pancreatic sec insulin secretory dysfunction with insulin resistance is the type 2 diabetes process in a nutshell. The liver is involved. It's a glucose-producing organ. In between meals, it keeps us alive by keeping glucose concentrations normal. It's also insulin responsive. It's also insulin resistant in patients who are destined to become diabetic. So the insulin molecule cannot shut off glucose production. So the liver pours more glucose into the circulation, even in the postprandial setting when it should be shut off by insulin. There are incretin hormones. These are neuroendocrine peptides that uh, emanate from the GI tract, travel to the endocrine pancreas, turbocharging the pancreas to make more insulin and also to suppress glucagon. Those signals are abnormal in patients with type 2 diabetes or, or prediabetes and metabolic syndrome. And finally, the kidney is also involved. It's a pop-off valve. So if your blood glucose exceeds, exceeds 180, it's supposed to get rid of glucose. And in diabetes, guess what? It compounds the problem because it only has the pop-off valve set at 240. So all of these pathophysiological abnormalities have been confirmed in people with type 2 diabetes. And I put the brain here because any time investigators have actually taken the, um, uh, the question as to whether the brain might be involved, there's always a connection between the brain and obesity and these organ systems. And we're just at an infancy level of trying to understand those abnormalities. So now that you uh, know the pathophysiology of diabetes, we can get into the major drug categories for diabetes, right? Because you have that background. So uh, obviously insulin replaces insulin deficiency. Sulfonylureas stimulate the pancreas to make more insulin. The thiazolidinediones or TZDs are insulin sensitizers. They work mainly in muscle to improve insulin signaling. Metformin improves insulin sensitivity in the liver, not so much in the muscle. The incretin-enhancing drugs, the GLP-1 agonists and the DPP-4 inhibitors, it gets confusing now because of all these letters. It's like an alphabet soup. But the GLP-1s and DPP-4s focus on the incretin system. The GLP-1s replace the major incretin, which is GLP-1, and the DPP-4s simply inhibit the enzyme that degrades your own incretins, so it's like a double negative. So by taking that pill, you have more incretin uh, action in your body. And then the SGLT2 inhibitors um, are the glucose excreting medication. They increase, uh, the, I'm sorry, they decrease the glucose threshold, increasing glucose excretion, reducing plasma glucose uh, concentrations. So here are the seven major categories, some of the generic names you might recognize. They each lower hemoglobin A1C uh, about the same. I mean, maybe the SGLT2s and the DPP4s are a little bit weaker, at least in the first six months in the traditional therapies. You might think that insulin would be the, the leader in terms of A1C reductions, and conceptually, it is. I mean, you, you can get somebody from an A1C of 20% down to normal if you give enough insulin. But actually, when you use it in clinical trials in type 2 diabetes, it still lowers hemoglobin A1C about 1% to 2%, which is what most drugs uh, do. In fact, when compared to the GLP-1 agonists, uh, very often the GLP-1s are as effective as uh, insulin, although in a theoretical case where you have an A1C, like I said, of 20%, you're never going to get somebody down to normal except you use insulin, but those patients don't show up in clinical trials. The mechanisms we've briefly discussed... And the important point about diabetes treatment is that you're not only lowering glucose, but you're trying to take advantages of other side benefits, uh, so-called perks of diabetes medications, such as weight loss, uh, 
uh, as we'll see, cardiovascular benefit, uh, blood pressure reductions, et cetera. And also consider that there are many negatives of diabetes treatments. There's very few lunches in, uh, fr there are very few free lunches, I should say, in diabetes management, maybe with the exception of, of the DPP-4 inhibitors, which are pretty bland drugs. In fact, they're not that effective, as mentioned, but they've become exceedingly popular, less so now with the advent of the SGLT2 inhibitors. But at one point, the DPP-4 inhibitors were uh, certainly surpassing the sulfonylureas, which had a 40-year head start on the DPP-4 inhibitors, and were closing in on metformin sales in terms of uh, what was uh, being prescribed in the U.S. And the reason being is that I told you they were amongst the least effective of agents, but the reason that they were so popular is that they were the drug category associated with the least phone calls from patients because they were so bland that patients just had very few side effects. And then not, let's not forget that there's a significant cost with some of the newer products. Um, I'm not sure I included the cost slides, but just to give you an example, metformin and sulfonylureas and even generic pioglitazone, which is a TZD, is somewhere between 4 and uh, maybe $10 a month where some of the newer formulations, particularly the highest doses of GLP-1 agonists, are over $1,000 a month. So that's almost 100 or more than 100-fold difference in terms of uh, using them. And that needs to be considered as well when you're making your prescribing decisions. Now, the talk today is based on cardiovascular complications. And I hope I've convinced you that glucose control by itself does not have a significant impact on uh, major cardiovascular uh, events in patients with type 2 diabetes. And now I want to discuss the specific question about using a particular agent in cardiovascular risk reduction. So I must admit that there's not a lot of trials here looking at particularly insulin and cell phonylureas, but what we can deduce from the literature is that insulin itself does not have any specific benefit on cardiovascular events in type 2 diabetes. And SUs at one time were felt to aggravate cardiovascular risk. That's actually not true. They do result in hypoglycemia, but cardiovascular events with both insulin and sulfonylureas are equivalent to non-use of those agents, whether it's compared to placebo or other medications, um, including, uh, for instance, a DPP-4 inhibitor. So there's neutrality for these drug classes as well. What about metformin? Well, metformin, uh, we uh, teach that is a cardiac-friendly uh, medication, and these are the um, uh, data from the UK PDS. Unfortunately, it was a very small sub-study within the UK PDS, so the robustness of this data is just not there. But having said that, when you compare it to diet, which we would never do nowadays, you were, you were allowed to get the blood glucose, I believe, up to 240 with diet in the UK PDS without intervening. Um, metformin seemed to have a reduction in myocardial infarctions, as well as in cardiovascular mortality compared to the placebo arm. Not statistically different, by the way, than insulin or SUs, but insulin and SUs were not statistically different from uh, conventional uh, diet as well. There is a, another study called the HOME trial, which uh, looked at this question of metformin and its cardiovascular benefit. These were insulin-treated type 2 diabetes patients, added metformin versus placebo, and you had a very similar reduction in their cardiovascular risk, specifically here MACE, which is, uh, for those of you that are not necessarily living and breathing clinical trials, MACE is a common outcome used in lipid-lowering trials, blood pressure-lowering trials. It stands for major adverse cardiovascular events and is the trio of MI, stroke, and CV death. That's a very typical primary outcome for many of these cardiovascular outcome uh, trials. So this is the MACE effect in favor of uh, metformin, 0 0.61, which, as you remember, was exactly the hazard ratio or the risk reduction, I should say, uh, that was seen in the uh, metformin arm of the UK PDS. So there's probably something here, but this study was even smaller. It was only 390 patients. This is all mainly in the pre-statin era. There'll never be a large CV outcome trial with uh, metformin. Actually, there is one underway. I should uh, not say that at, in the VA, but it's mainly focused on pre-diabetes uh, uh, patients. So, so I don't think we know about uh, metformin uh, specifically. What about the thiazolidine dions? These were the glitazones. Again, they were very popular about 15 years ago, less so now. This is pioglitazone, which is the uh, a TCD 
that is suspected of having the best cardiovascular data. And this is from the proactive study. This is MACE, and there was a 16% relative risk reduction uh, in favor of pioglutazone. So suspected to be anti-atherosclerotic. Unfortunately, increases heart failure because it increases fluid retention and in compro compromised uh, ventricles, such as patients with um, uh, burgeoning heart failure or uh, diastolic dysfunction, you can actually induce heart failure uh, events. And it's actually interesting from a um, historical perspective uh, to note that in proactive, overall, there were 57 fewer events for MACE in favor of pioglitazone, and there was exactly that number, 57 additional events of heart failure hospitalizations, leading um, uh, to the intelligent question of, you know, what is the risk to benefit ratio from the cardiovascular system uh, when using uh, pioglitazone? We personally feel that you can mitigate the heart failure risk with lower doses, and this was the full 45 milligram dose uh, in uh, proactive. And I'll show you some additional data uh, with a, a pre-diabetes trial with uh, pioglitazone later on. So question mark for metformin, kind of a plus minus for TCDs, but no home run yet despite decades of uh, cardiovascular outcome trials in uh, diabetes. So now we get to the um, more modern therapies uh, beginning in about 2006, so the DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1s, and SGLT-2 uh, inhibitors. So before I present those data, I wanted to remind you that uh, as of as late as 2015, the current strategy, or the strategy at that time, I should say, of managing type 2 diabetes is denoted on this slide. This is the ADA-EASD uh, combined guidelines. The EASD is the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. And basically, this is before we had cardiovascular outcome positive data from any of these drugs. The writing group felt that, you know, you started with lifestyle, you tried to lose weight, eat healthy, and then you gave metformin as number one drug foundation therapy. It was cheap. It was maybe cardiac friendly, um, no hypoglycemia, a few pounds of weight loss. It seemed, it seemed like a good drug to use. You had to be careful in renal patients because of lactic acidosis, but for the most part, it was a reasonably good uh, starting point for diabetes treatment. And then we know that if uh, you follow patients long-term with diabetes, they often require layers of therapy because the beta cell dysfunction that I started the talk about continues as people get older. Beta cell function continues to decline and you need additional therapies to maintain glucose control. So you added a second drug. So combination therapy, just like we use in hypertension, became the standard. So if you were a traditionalist, you would add a sulfonylurea, like glipizide. If you believed in insulin resistance being the fundamental abnormality of diabetes, and you bought into this concept of insulin resistance driving cardiovascular risk, which is plenty of data suggesting that, you used a TZD, as long as you were cautious with dosing and be careful not to use it in patients with heart failure. If you didn't like phone calls from patients, you'd use a DPP-4 inhibitor. If you were uh, coaxed by new drugs, you know, this is a newer, sexy compound coming out in 2014, uh, increased glucose excretion, lowered blood pressure, lowered weight, maybe a cardiovascular benefit, you'd use that. If your patients didn't mind injecting, you try to convince them to use a GLP-1 agonist, particularly if they were obese and especially if they wanted to lose weight, because this was a drug category that was associated with the most weight loss. And if you thought that the patient was not going to respond for whatever reason to any of these agents, you'd use insulin. And insulin had the advantage of being able to completely titratable, and ultimately, you might need to use combination uh, injectable therapies, such as might be seen in a type 1 patient, basal insulin plus mealtime insulin. And we also got um, familiar with basal insulin plus a GLP-1, which actually that combination is just as good as basal insulin and mealtime insulin in terms of A1C reduction. And because some of the compounds got to once weekly dosing, the choice of the patient was clear. As long as they had good insurance, would you rather take one injection of nighttime basal insulin and once weekly injection of a GLP-1, 
Or would you rather have one injection of basal insulin at night and three injections of mealtime insulin and having to check your blood sugar before each meal? So what is that? That's three times seven is 21 plus the seven basals is 28 injections per week or seven plus one, which is eight. So from a patient's perspective, they certainly, as long as they didn't have any GI intolerance to the GLP-1, they would go with that. And from a physician's perspective, you got just as good A1C control. And not only that, you got weight loss instead of weight gain, and you had less hypos instead of more hypos. So it's kind of a no-brainer in most patients. Obviously, there are some patients with very anemic beta cell uh, function, which needed insulin no matter, no matter what. So you'd march through from monotherapy to dual therapy to triple therapy and ultimately to combination injectable therapy. But importantly, uh, there was no mention at all in these guidelines about cardiovascular risk. Obviously, you lower blood pressure with uh, ARBs or a ACE inhibitors. You lowered LDL with uh, statins. You gave antiplatelet therapy. So it wasn't like you didn't address cardiovascular risk, but from a glucose control perspective, uh, there was no mention of cardiovascular impact of these uh, therapies. And then the world really changed in 2008. And in that year, it was the regulatory bodies that drove the pharmaceutical industry uh, to conduct uh, long-term, big cardiovascular outcome trials, or CVOTs, I may use that acronym, uh, in order to demonstrate, at the very least, cardiovascular safety, if not efficacy. So this was the um, guidance to industry from the FDA that was released in late 2008 and became enacted essentially in 2009. And this, I won't go into the details in terms of, you know, what they wanted in terms of numbers of patients and hazard ratios, but the bottom line is the FDA told the pharmaceutical industry, if you're bringing a new drug to market in the U.S., you have to show at least that the drug is not increasing cardiovascular events because there had been some... Uh, drugs that had been terminated in clinical development because of the suggestion of cardiovascular risk. So this basically set the playing field, saying that, you know, we want you to do these many patients this number of years uh, to convince us that you're not having increased cardiovascular risk. Now, the pharmaceutical companies obviously complied with that guidance or they wouldn't get their drugs to market, but also uh, started thinking about adding a few thousand patients to these trials to not only prove non-inferiority, but also to prove superiority, because they had the sense that some of their drugs may actually be the holy grail in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk as well as lowering glucose. So this is what uh, happened with these uh, trials, is there was this huge um, uh, push to get thousands of patients in these CV outcome trials beginning in 2009. And the DPP-4 inhibitors were first, then the SGLT2 inhibitors, and then the GLP-1 receptor agonists. In terms of the DPP-4 inhibitors, again, this is kind of a, a, an old story now, neutrality, neutrality, neutrality. None of these drugs actually impacted cardiovascular risk. They were safe. They didn't aggravate risk, but they didn't decrease cardiovascular risk. One of the compounds actually increased heart failure, saxagliptin. The reason for that is not clear, but the studies were designed to look at MACE, and each of these studies were uh, neutral. And then the second of the uh, categories that came to publication were the SGLT2 inhibitors. And that's what we're going to talk about. Just a reminder, SGLT2 is a co-transporter for sodium and glucose. It's in the proximal nephron. It leads to the reabsorption of all this glucose, which is the same as the glucose concentration in the, glomerular, uh, in the uh, blood flow to the glomerulus. So the glomerular filtrate glucose is equivalent to plasma glucose. And if we didn't have these transporters, both two and one, we'd be glucosuric all the time. In fact, there are uh, genetic mutations of SGLT2 when patients walk around, they're peeing out glucose. Uh, they're not predisposed to obesity or diabetes, interestingly, and their kidneys are totally healthy. If you block SGLT2, you increase glucose excretion about 300 calories per day, and Absorption is blocked, so excretion is enhanced, and plasma glucose levels come down without hypoglycemia because the body has mechanisms to prevent hypoglycemia in terms of reducing insulin. And several cardiovascular risk factor benefits. Not to say that this was proof of cardiovascular uh, 
uh, uh, event reduction, but seemingly blood pressure, weight, uh, uh, triglycerides, maybe these had uh, some hope of being that holy grail. And some risks like genital infections because of glucose in the urine, particularly in women. Initially, some concerns of UTIs. I think that concern has abated. Uh, interestingly, uh, DKA occurred when uh, clinicians started using these medications in type 1 diabetes patients who shouldn't take these medications, at least at this point, uh, because of de uh, alterations in fat metabolism and an increase in ketosis events in their euglycemic because glucose continues to come out through the urine. So it can be very misleading to the emergency room physician to see a patient who looks dehydrated as if they're in DKA, but with a normal plasma glucose concentration. And urinary uh, frequency, uh, polyuria, the tendency for dehydration, a slight drop in the GFR initially, which, as we'll show you, is actually uh, not something that is sustained over time and actually improves renal outcomes, uh, and a few other uh, concerns during uh, drug development as well. Remember, the glucose threshold normally is 180, and diabetes is 240, and when you use a glucose, uh, a certain glucose uh, inhibitor, you reduce it down to 70. So even when their blood glucose is normal, they're still urinating out uh, glucose. So this was the first study, the EMPA-REG outcome trial, which used empagliflozin in a high-risk population of patients with cardiovascular disease, a 14% relative risk reduction. Not huge, admittedly, but a landmark because it was the first time that investigators had convincingly shown that you could reduce cardiovascular events with a diabetes medication. The important component of MACE that drove the risk reduction was this large reduction in CV death, which may be the most important component of, of MACE. And this early divergence of the event curve suggesting that this effect may not be driven through atherosclerosis, which was the, the paradigm that we had been seeking, maybe more hemodynamic. I don't think we, we know yet. Uh, from a, a meta-analysis standpoint, uh, you get a 10% relative risk reduction in MACE, a 15% relative risk reduction in CV death, and a larger risk reduction in heart failure, again first seen in the Emperor outcome trial, 35%. This makes more sense because the drug has an S in it, so that's a sodium uh, uh, glucose co-transporter inhibitor, so you do have a little bit of a naturetic effect. So this may not have been as surprising as the CV death effect. Also very early divergence of the event curves at about one month. You start to see a statistical difference between the groups, 35% risk reduction. And this is more consistent across, across the trials. With the other endpoints, there was a little bit more variability. Uh, with the heart failure outcome, it's highly consistent, about 32% relative risk reduction. It occurs in patients with or without CVD, so you don't have to have coronary disease to have this benefit. And it occurs in patients with or without heart failure. So the point estimate here is very similar in those patients with or without heart failure. So you're not only reducing the deterioration of heart failure, you're actually preventing new heart failure from developing, which is a radical concept for a glucose-lowering uh, medication. So radical that the cardiologists uh, jumped on the bandwagon. So just like we lost the statins to cardiologists, I think we've lost the SGLT2 inhibitors to cardiologists. I'm talking about an endocrinology uh, perspective. Just kidding. Um, uh, so this is dapagliflozin. And this is a HEF-REF study, so reduced ejection fraction heart failure patients. 26% reduction in their primary outpoint, which is a stereotyped uh, uh, outcome in heart failure trials, which is worsening heart failure, usually heart failure hospitalization, and cardiovascular mortality. And you can see that the um, point estimate for the reduction in patients with or without diabetes was the same. So because it's a heart failure study, it wasn't a diabetes trial. You know, it does a diabetes drug, but it wasn't a diabetes trial. So 55% of the patients in this trial did not have type 2 diabetes. 45% did. And you can see that the risk reduction is the same. So it's obviously not to do with glucose uh, or hemoglobin A1C. This is the second trial, Emperor reduced using empagliflozin, HEFREF, again, very similar reduction and a very similar uh, non-heterogeneity, as they say, uh, between the diabetic and the non-diabetic uh, subgroups. 
And most recently, this is the first HEF-PEF trial, so preserved ejection fraction heart failure. Many people didn't think the drug was going to work because nothing seems to work in HEF-PEF for a variety of reasons. But guess what? The SGLT2 inhibitors did. This is a 21% risk reduction in hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular mortality. The kidney, also surprising, because when the drugs were first developed, we wondered if this would be a terrible idea for the kidney to have all this glucose. You know, maybe there's uh, some glycation end product that's going to harm the kidney. Uh, but remember, the patients with familial um, renal glucosuria, FRG, which is that mutation that uh, leads to inhibition of or, or uh, no SGLT2 uh, 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 transporter in the nephron, they actually survive with normal kidney function, normal life, lifespan. Um, so maybe that concern was, was misdirected. But the data is here. So worsening nephropathy, um, you'd rather be on the red line than the black line. So this is a significant 39% reduction in the progression of CKD. And this is that initial dip that I talked about before. There was a concern initially. You lose about 3 to 5 milliliters per minute on your GFR. But that's hemodynamic. It's like what you see with a RAS blockade like an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And you can see that over time, it stabilizes. And in the non-treated group, placebo, you get slow decline. So at the end of the day, you actually have better renal function if you're taking the SGLT2 inhibitor. And indeed, across a meta-analysis, the risk reduction is 38%. These are huge numbers. And you know the nephrologists have also jumped on the bandwagon because they haven't had a new drug to treat uh, kidney disease, specifically diabetic kidney disease, uh, in uh, 25 years uh, with the ARBs last time I checked. Um, now, that outcome here um, is uh, not a hard outcome. This includes macroalbuminuria, which I don't want. I want my patients to get, but nephrologists kind of smile at that because it's not considered uh, a hard outcome. It's the equivalent of un an unstable angina hospitalization. In, in the cardiovascular world. So now if you look at hard outcomes, which is about as hard as you can get, dialysis, trans, transplantation, or renal death, you get just as good a benefit. So you don't have not wider confidence intervals, perhaps, because the event numbers are lower. But the point is, is that this is not just an albuminuria effect. It's actually an effect on renal function deterioration. And the first of the renal trials are seen here. This is the DAPA CKD trial using dapagliflozin, 39% hard outcome reduction. And just like with Emperor uh, uh, series and DAPA HF, they recruited patients with or without diabetes. Now, because they mandated albuminuria as an enrollment criteria, you were enriched with diabetes patients. So instead of the 55-45 non-DM to DM ratio in DAPA HF and DAPA CKD it was more like two-thirds, one-third, two-thirds uh, patients with diabetes. Yet the hazard ratios, if anything, at least by the eye, not to the statistician's eye because the p-value for interaction, meaning the heterogeneity between these effects was non-significant, but to my non-statistician's eyes, it looks like the effect may be even a little stronger if you don't have diabetes. So Credence was a third trial, but that was solely in diabetes patients. We talked about DAPA CKD, large benefits. Empikidney is next. That'll be out next year. And this will be interesting because albuminuria is not necessarily mandated in that trial. So lots of benefit. There's an outlier with ertagliflozin. I'm not sure exactly why, but most of the SGLT2 inhibitors have had a cardiovascular benefit. And the last one would be the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Now, this is a different axis. This is the neuroendocrine secretion from the GI tract, which is the first organ to interact with food, sending signals to the pancreas that activates beta cells to make more insulin, suppresses alpha cells to make less glucagon. And that's a good thing for blood glucose concentrations. A reminder, DPP-4, remember the DPP-4 inhibitors, is the enzyme that chews up our own incretin. So if you inhibit that enzyme, as I mentioned before, a double negative, you increase your endogenous GLP-1 and a second incretin peptide called GIP, glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide. 
but this pales in comparison to a GLP-1. You're giving pharmacological doses of the GLP-1, which uh, explains some of the GI toxicity in terms of nausea and in some circumstances vomiting if you increase the dose too quickly. We certainly don't have time to talk about the uh, decades now of studies of GLP-1 and all the uh, tissues that express GL GLP-1 receptors. Uh, they are in the heart, so there may be a cardioprotective effect in the heart. It decreases appetite in the brain. It slows gastric emptying that uh, relates to the nausea that, you've, that, you, um, that uh, patients um, experienced. I'm not sure if I've signed out from, I hope I haven't signed out from the Zoom. Have I? I don't think so. Minimize. Okay. My Zoom is still open, so I'm not sure why I got that. Um, anyway, uh, and there are effects on the uh, pancreatic uh, beta cells and alpha cells, as, uh, as, as, as mentioned. And again, like with any medication, you have benefits, you have risks, but lots of the potential for cardiovascular risk reduction in terms of larger reductions in weight, effects on uh, uh, lipid metabolism, reductions also in albuminuria, but some risks in terms of the GI toxicity is the fact that most of these compounds are still injectables. When they first came out, they were all injectables, which is not necessarily popular for patients. Question of pancreatitis risk and medullary carcinoma, but only in laboratory animals has not been shown in humans uh, at this point. So right now, the landscape of GLP-1s are shown here. The three that are available in the U.S. that have shown cardiovascular risk reduction are uh, liraglutide or liraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide. And the dula and sema products are weekly uh, formulations. This is the original study, 13% relative risk reduction using liraglutide in liter, uh, very similar to what you see with the SGLT2 inhibitor. Across the spectrum of the GLP-1s, this is now an eight-study meta-analysis just published two months ago, 14% MACE reduction, 13% CV death reduction, 10% MI reduction, all statistically significant, and a larger effect for some reason in stroke. So uh, in stroke patients benefit, um, or I should say not stroke patients, but patients to prevent stroke seem to benefit the most in terms of the 17% relative risk reduction. And this is across the board, no matter what subgroup you look at, uh, weekly versus daily formulations, people with or without CVD, older patients, um, more obese patients, there is no statistical heterogeneity. So it seems to affect, be a benefit in all these uh, subgroups. Mortality reductions of 12%. Heart failure does go down about 11%, statistically significant, but uh, less than a third of the benefit you get from the SGLT2s. And there's also a renal outcome, but if you remove the albuminuria component, remember the hard outcome, your results are not statistically significant. So maybe this may require more time, um, but it's certainly not as good, just like with heart failure, not as good as the SGLT2 inhibitors. So a little bit more heterogeneity between these trials. There have been um, a couple of negative trials. One of the compounds is no longer available because of marketing issues, and we're now mainly uh, dealing with Lira, Sema, and Dula in this uh, country. Uh, Sema and Dula, as mentioned, are weekly, whereas Lira is a daily formulation. There's this new compound that is in investigation. It's a combined activator of GLP-1 and GIP receptors called terzepatide. And here I show because I've never seen results like this in diabetes trials. So the mean A1C at the end of the study from a mean starting point of 8.3, I believe, or 8.4, was uh, at the highest dose down to 5.8%, almost approaching not only the non-diabetic range, well, you can't use that term analogy if you're treating with the diabetes medication, but almost in the, in the lower than the pre-diabetes range. It's extraordinary. And, uh, you know, 2.5% reductions in A1C, and that's driven by this huge reduction in body weight. So you get a 12 kilo loss, which is a 13% reduction in, in, in body weight. So if you think about that, that's, that's uh, 27, 28 pounds, um, which is starting to flirt with the lower uh, bound of the confidence intervals for what you get with bariatric procedures. Not as good. I'm not saying it's as good as bariatric procedures where you can see 
uh, 50 to 80 pounds, but with, with uh, certainly with um, uh, bands, uh, this will start to compete. And uh, this may not be plateauing. So we may be able one day to offer patients pharmacological therapies, admittedly expensive and potentially lifelong, that start to compete with the lower end of what you get with bariatric uh, procedures. So neutral, positive for uh, the uh, 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 cardiac benefit uh, for the GLP-1s, also for the SGLT-2s, with the additional renal benefit of the SGLT-2 inhibitors. So I wanted to just, before I uh, conclude, uh, give you this little peek to the history of uh, TZDs and some new information uh, regarding their cardiovascular benefit. So I won't get into the sordid history of what's happened to the TZDs, but lots of concerns about side effects in the early 2000s, and they're now down to about 5% of diabetes drug sales from a peak of about 25% in 2006, 2007. Uh, we were uh, uh, stupid enough to begin a uh, pioglitazone study right before all those adversities became known. So this is a very difficult study to complete uh, because of concerns of investigators and patients. Um, so I'm always amazed we're able to actually finish this study uh, in the face of all the bad press about pioglitazone. But we took stroke patients who did not have diabetes but had insulin resistance. This is an equation looking at their insulin and their glucose levels. And uh, those patients with the highest insulin levels have the highest HOMA value, and we included them in the studies if they had insulin resistance based on the HOMA. We randomized them to PIO versus placebo over five years. And when you're recruiting patients with, pre with um, insulin resistance and you're excluding patients with diabetes, you get a lot of patients with prediabetes. About two-thirds of our patients, depending on definition, have prediabetes. And this is the outcome, a 24% risk reduction in the primary outcome, which was essentially MACE. We called it fatal non-fatal MI or stroke. And also the patients did not have diabetes. We prevented their diabetes by more than 50%, which has been shown in other TZD uh, trials. So let's go to the guidelines. So this is the old guidelines, right? They're kind of seem almost antiquated uh, just in the last five or six years. These are the new guidelines. And this is from ADA EASD. It's complicated. We're not going to march through it specifically. But the money of this slide is on the left-hand side, which is what is the next step after metformin? So they still feel metformin is drug one. But if you need additional glucose-lowering agent, you ask three basic questions. Does your patient have CVD, heart failure, or CKD? And you can predict, if you've been paying attention, what the next step would be. So if you have CVD, either or GLP-1 or SGLT-2. If you have heart failure or CKD, then an SGLT-2. It's, it's, it's that simple. Now, considering other issues, right? If patients have uh, nephrostomy tubes, you may not use an SGLT-2 inhibitor. If someone has gastroparesis, you may not want to use a GLP-1. So you have to be patient-centered, but all of the things being equal, that is the evidence-based approach to uh, practice. This is the same algorithm. They've made it a little bit easier to read because they've dissected out heart failure and CKD. But again, ASCVD, GLP-1 or SGLT-2, heart failure, SGLT-2, CKD, uh, SGLT-2. They do have this uh, cute uh, uh, couple of sentences in the text, which basically says, and I won't read it, but basically says, you know, this metformin stuff, we've kind of been wedded to metformin for like 20 years. And maybe, if you want, you don't have to start with metformin. But we didn't say that because we're diabetologists and we love metformin. But maybe if you think the patient uh, either doesn't tolerate metformin or you want to go right to this more evidence-based strategy of a G GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 inhibitor, uh, they give you the carte blanche to do that. This is a second algorithm from ACE, which is the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Very similar. If you have these comorbidities, these are the drugs to use. The cardiologists have also released diabetes guidelines. What are they doing re releasing diabetes guidelines? We don't release coronary artery disease guidelines, but uh, I'm teasing. But it actually is 
interesting. Uh, we've done a, stud, a study with uh, Dr. Kozabarot, who's here in Kansas City, and we showed that if you are a cardiologist, either in New Haven, where I come from, or in K Kansas City, you see four times as many diabetic patients with CVD as does a diabetologist or endocrinologist. Now, that might be simply that there's four times as many cardiologists as endocrinologists. If you have heart failure, your chances of seeing a cardiologist are eightfold more frequent than seeing an endocrinologist. So clearly, if you want to change practice, you've got to speak to cardiologists. They have to understand the data and be bold enough to, at the very least, make suggestions to their primary care colleagues or even their endocrinologists to adjust the therapy in order to take advantage of the cardiovascular benefits. So here they're uh, pushing the envelope a little bit in that they say drug-naive patients should just go to the SGLT2s or GLP-1s, forget about metformin. And the diabetologists don't say that, but they kind of hinted that that may not be a crazy idea. So I'm going to summarize, and I thank you for your attention. The first point is that uh, correcting the major defect of diabetes, which you know, last time we checked was glucose, hyperglycemia, doesn't do all that much for cardiovascular disease risk reduction. In terms of the older agents, SUs, insulin, no effect. Metformin, maybe. Data set, small, not robust. TCDs, confusing. Maybe an athero benefit, uh, but a heart failure risk, so not a clear home run there. So in 2008, FDA started mandating show me the money, and tell me that your diabetes drug is not only lowering glucose, but at least safe for the heart. And the first series of these trials with the DPP-4 inhibitors showed that they were safe but not effective in reducing cardiovascular risk. In contrast, two drug categories, SGLT2s, GLP-1s, have clearly demonstrated modest reductions in cardiovascular events, large reductions for the SGLT2 inhibitors for heart failure hospitalization, and the progression of CKD. And don't forget about pioglitazone. I still feel that when dosed in uh, small amounts, maybe 15, not pushing the dose to 45 milligrams, you can mitigate the heart failure risk. And I feel there's a still a potent anti-atherosclerotic effect of this medication, and maybe it requires a second look. And clearly, all of these data, just over the last five or six years, after decades of searching for the Holy Grail, have finally begun to affect the guidelines, which really start to change practice, favoring uh, at least SGLT2s and GLP-1s in the prevention of patients with uh, CVD or at risk for CVD. With that, I thank you again for your attention. I'd be happy to take any uh, questions or comments you might have. Thanks very much. Thank you for the outstanding lecture. Um, really enjoy it. Uh, question is, do you have, are you aware of any studies um, going on on type 1 diabetic patients with heart disease and SGLT2 inhibitors? No, but it should be done, right? I think everyone is um, <clears throat> just trying to digest the uh, effects of these medications in type 2, but many of our type 1 diabetes patients have CVD, and Many of them, even more, have CKD. So I do think that that is a group that needs to be studied. Type 1 studies are hard to do because there are not that many type 1 diabetes patients, and they're often very complex in terms of their glucose control strategies. The risk, as you're, I assume, assume alluding to, is the DKA risk, which uh, occurs in up to almost 10% of patients with type 1s who take these medications. Um, that is a potentially serious complication. So if the study is done, it has to be, uh, at, you know, certain centers that are used to treating type 1 diabetes patients with great education of the patients, how to detect ketosis, maybe with ketone monitoring uh, to prevent uh, these events. But it, it's I have no doubt this, the medications would be effective in those patients. The question is, how do you prove it? And, uh, you know, drug companies tend to be risk-averse, so I'm not sure they're necessarily interested in, in taking this on. This probably would be a good NIH uh, study at, at one point, maybe for a younger investigator in the audience, but it's a huge unmet need, I think. Good question. <clears throat> 
other comments or questions? Yes. Do you want to speculate on the uh, mechanism for the SGL2 sure. benefits outside of the glucose lowering effect? So the renal benefit is maybe a little easier because I think there's more um, agreement from the nephrology community. Uh, it seems to be not dissimilar to what you see with the RAS blockade uh, drug, so RAS, um, uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, that um, at least last time I checked, this was the theory that they reduced interglomerular pressure by uh, activating the, um, uh, in a vasoactive manner, uh, the outflow from the uh, glomerulus, right? So this is the efferent arterial uh, became more dilated, decreasing pressure, and with less barotrauma over time, there was less uh, CKD progression. I think that's still the concept that nephrologists pro have promulgated. So the, um, and, you, and you have the same drop in GFR that we saw on that slide with the SGLT2s. But the SGLT2s, it may be similar but different in that it decreases the blood flow to the glomerulus through the afferent tone. It has to do with um, uh, a, a physiological process called TGF or um, um, tubular glomerular feedback. And uh, when you reverse that or, or ameliorate that, you get this reduction in the flow, uh, increase in tone of the afferent arterial. So you're decreasing blood flow to the glomerulus. That sounds like a bad thing, but it, it's, you only pay two to three mill, mill, milliliters per minute. Over time, that decreases barotrauma. That's one theory. There are other theories in terms of uh, reduction in oxidative stress because of less activation of the, the, uh, the energy metabolism that you need to resorb glucose. And there may be something there because um, there, there is some evidence that uh, activation of erythropoietin may be linked to this uh, process. So I don't think we know, but, but a popular theory is reduction in barotrauma. For the cardiovascular benefit, you get at least five or six theories. There's a ketone hypothesis. The drugs increase beta hydroxybutyrate a tiny bit. Some people feel that VHB is a better fuel source for the heart, particularly the failing heart. You get more ATP than uh, glucose or free fatty acids, which is the usual diet in, uh, for the heart in type 2 diabetes. We've shown that reductions in plasma volume, uh, as reflected by increases in hematocrit, explain at least 50% of the benefit. Uh, but now we're starting to doubt that because uh, other investigators have shown this erythropoietin effect that I alluded to before, uh, that erythropoietin does increase and maybe the increase in hematocrit is not simply hemoconcentration and therefore offloading the heart and reducing afterload and preload, but might actually uh, increase oxygen delivery. Uh, it sounds a little funny to me because when they did the EPO studies a few years ago, if anything, there were more cardiovascular events or at least no protection. So I'm not... Uh, fully convinced that it's erythropoietin uh, mediated. Um, but bottom line is we don't know. Yes. Just jump on that same question. One of the questions I've been asked when I've talked about this is that um, whether there should be, uh, we should be cutting down uh, the furosemide in half when we do that SGLT2. Yeah, I, the it's not that powerful a diuretic. It's a, it's a modest diuretic that has a sustained effect. Um, whereas you don't have the normal uh, neural humoral compensatory mechanisms kick in. So when you use a, a furosemide, you get plasma volume reduction, but by the end of uh, a week, you're back to square one because of <laughs> ADH, aldosterone, uh, catecholamines, et cetera. You don't seem to get the same activation of those uh, counter-regulatory uh, effects. And the reason for that is not clear. It may be uh, tricking the kidney because you're blocking sodium, you're increasing sodium delivery to the important macula densa, and the macula may be tricked into thinking that the patient is volume replete. And maybe that plasma volume reduction, without the negative connotations of plasma volume reduction, uh, is the secret to the SGLT2 inhibitors. But your question is about what do you do with diuretics, which I'm avoiding <laughs> because, we don't, I do. because we, we don't know. But I think the, the most common sense approach, I'll give you two bits of information. There was a review article about four years ago by a cardiologist from Canada that had a very solid recommendation. If your patient is wet, you don't decrease. If your patient is dry, you do decrease. If the patient is uvolemic, you don't decrease, but you follow closely. Logical? 
and it's never been tested in a clinical trial. And the last bit of information I'll give you is that I was involved in the DAPA-HF trial, and I was terrified that these patients who had HEFREF with mean uh, LVEFs of around 30%, I believe. So these patients had you know, real uh, reductions in their LVEF, and they were all on loop diuretics, or the vast majority were. And I was terrified that we're going to give this new diuretic to these patients, and we were going to have a lot of AKI. And we didn't. In fact, you had less AKI in the SGLT2 inhibitor group. And the, uh, you know, the investigators were allowed to modulate the diuretic dose, but we actually looked at what they did. Most of them did not. And these were heart failure cardiologists that are very skilled in managing, um, you know, extracellular fluid volume, I would assume. And that was the uh, class effect? That, that was the class effect with all this here, people, or just with the DAPA? Uh, heart failure hospitalization reduction, or? No, no, I'm talking about uh, when you didn't see the AKI. Oh, yeah, There's okay, sorry, 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 yeah. Uh, other studies, all the studies that have looked at AKI have shown a 20 to 30% reduction in AKI. So there's something about the medications that you know, preserve renal energy somehow to withstand insults because they all had insults. You know, they all had influenza or uh, GI bleeds, and they were all placed at a, a contrast nephropathy. They all were predisposed to events of AKI, but something about being on SGLT2 inhibitor uh, protects the kidney, even though it has diuretic properties. I don't understand it, but that's, those are the data. I don't know if you're in a position to know this, but is there any reason to believe that these that the manufacturers for these SGL2 inhibitors saw this cardiovascular CKD benefit coming? Or is this something that they were very pleased to find out and now so, have so, taken a much so more I, I can role? actually answer that question because I was involved in the Emperor Egg outcome trial. And at the beginning of the trial, when we were just putting together the trial, I must say, uh, number one, I think I told either yesterday morning or yesterday evening, that I uh, am proud to have lost a very expensive bottle of champagne <laughs> on the Emperor Egg Outcome trial. So I bet one of the company representatives, this is a company-driven uh, trial. We were the academic steering committee, but it was driven by the, the Berenger Engelheim. And I, because I, I didn't believe, because I was jaded by, you know, my first 20 slides showing that you can't do anything with cardiovascular events. So I said, you know, I'll join the trial just because it's an interesting drug and I was interested in SGLT2 inhibitors and cardiovascular risk reduction, but there ain't no way this drug is going to be it. You pee out a little glucose, how is that going to help your heart? So we bet a very expensive bottle of champagne and I lost, and it was the best uh, bet that I've ever lost. Um, and I will tell you that when we set up the trial, it was simply a safety trial. We were simply trying to satisfy the FDA's demands for safety. So when you do a safety uh, trial, this is a little bit of inside baseball, but when you do a safety trial, you only have to recruit about 3,000 patients. Just in terms of the events, trust me, it's only about 3,000 patients. And that is because you're trying to demonstrate what's called non-inferiority. It's a funny phrase, but you're trying to say that this intervention isn't any worse than, this, than the traditional intervention. Sounds crazy, but that's what you do a safety trial for. Um, and then in the middle of the trial, and this is all documented, it's all uh, uh, available in, in the public domain, in the middle of the trial, the company had some data, and I forget exactly what it was, it may have been some subgroup analyses from some phase three trials, that they, they started thinking that this may actually have a cardiovascular benefit. I think it was a reduction in blood pressure in one trial, the reduction in albuminuria, the reduction in triglycerides, that somebody at the company said, you know what, as long as we're spending this much money to do this 3,000 patient study, let's double the sample size and let's go for superiority. This is now at least a year into the trial. And I actually remember this uh, rapidly um, put together teleconference that they said, hey, listen, we're thinking about changing the charter, which is the Bible of how the study is done. And we want you, your, the academic steering committee, to weigh in and to either agree or thumbs down it. And I remember that, and it, it, it was, a, I believe, a, more than a doubling of the sample size. 
So I was perfectly fine because, you know, you have double the patients, you're going to get more information from that trial. So it clearly, that anecdote tells you that initially, uh, even the company did not think that this was uh, necessarily, they just were there just to satisfy the FDA. Um, so maybe more, more information than you needed, but it, it proves the point that it wasn't necessarily uh, felt to be this uh, great drug that we found. Thank you. Yep. Very good. We appreciate it. Okay, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.